For the last two years, I've been working closely with the government of Papua New Guinea, chairing an independent advisory group on HIV, which advises the government, the development partners, and all of the agencies involved in HIV prevention work on how to upscale the quality of the work. And one of the biggest issues in Papua New Guinea is the Highlands Highway, which connects at one of its ends the open cast mines of Oktedi in the Sandown province of that country. At the other end, when it snaked its way across enormously complex and difficult terrain, the ports where the ore is exported to the world. And along that highway, the road is improved. But rates of infection in almost every stop are going up. People are actually stopping off more frequently. They're not driving along this long, smooth road, not stopping. And indeed, new forms of transactional sex. Entire book, Wayward Women, by one of the rep academics working here. Is she in the room here in Toronto University? Uh, Holly, are you here? <laughs> OK. Um, documents how new forms of transactional sex are emerging on that route. Not sex work, as traditionally understood, although I always have problems with traditionally understanding sex work anyway, but, but new forms of exchange where the lorries stop along the way, where food is obtained, where overnight rest takes place, and so on. So in that particular context, road improvements have produced quite the opposite effect. And context really matters, and it has to be the starting point for the work we do. Some of my other colleagues and friends, Judy Auerbach, uh, Justin Parkhurst, Carlos Cáceres, and Kimberly Keller, have just written a paper for the AIDS 2031 initiative. It's on the, well, actually, it was on the AIDS 2031 website until two weeks ago. And then when I checked last week, it seems to have disappeared. It says, please write to so-and-so for it. I don't know what that means about it. Anyway, in this paper, which is around social and structural drivers of the epidemic, you find this statement about poverty and how it too can produce contradictory effects. They say neither poverty nor wealth is a social driver per se. Rather, it's the context in which some people are wealthy or the context in which some people are poor that can lead to relational patterns resulting in forms of sexual networking that can spread HIV. Poor people in some settings may be more likely to engage in particular practices which may increase the risk of infection. And wealthy people in some settings may find that their wealth permits greater social and sexual networking or allows them to have a higher number of regular sex partners, which may put them at risk as well. I was in a hotel in Dar es Salaam two weeks ago for a conference on HIV, and they called it most at risk populations, another term I don't really like, especially when it's reduced to MARPS, as the acronym seems to be becoming. The more we use these acronyms, the more we distance ourselves, you know, from human beings and their circumstances. But anyway, in this hotel, in the room next to me, in the room across the corridor, all manner of sexual transactions were occurring as wealthy politicians from the capital dropped by, normally at 10 o'clock in the morning, to be gone by 4.30 in the afternoon. I said to the hotel, what, what's going on? They said, oh, we have block bookings on that floor. I said, why? They said, well, well you, can tell, you can tell your wife or partner you're going to the office and you can be back by tea time. This is extraordinary. Well, it was also reassuring the honesty with which the issue is visible and being talked about. It's not the same, of course, only in Dar es Salaam. I'm sure it's the same in the hotel here in Toronto that I'm staying in. I find it very strange that at 11.30, or sorry, 10, I'm on UK time. I find it very strange that at 9.30 this morning, 10.30 this morning, when I left the hotel, many of those rooms still have do not disturb on the door. Now, perhaps they all flew in like me last night and very sensibly are staying asleep this morning to catch up on their jet lag, but I very much doubt it. <laughs> I don't know. I could be completely off, off it here, but I suspect there's a, there's a kernel of truth in all of this, that transactional sex in all of its diversity, in all of its forms, and wealth, yeah, may create particular forms of vulnerability in the context of the epidemic that remain unaddressed to this day. This is just uh, one of the issues I think that Judy, Justin, and Carlos are encouraging us to think about. 
one way forward then and some ideas to, to think about and to take with you particularly those of you who are beginning to set up this this center for HIV prevention with this focus on social factors I'd like to just share with you a, a framework or the beginnings of a framework which which Judy Carlos Justin and others have developed for the AIDS 2031 initiative and it encourages to think carefully about two different sets of factors first the causes of social vulnerability be they distal or proximal and secondly the focus of programmatic actions be they focused on the individual the group the community or the society as a whole and if you put these two levels together you can come up with a kind of mapping, and this is global mapping, it's a, it's a busy picture, so I'm preparing you for what's coming up next. You could end up with a global mapping that looks just a little bit like this. And here you can see, on the left-hand side, a measure of how, I mean, th these are familiar concepts to many of you, I'm sure, the notion of proximal and distal, how close you are to being able to influence behavior. And on the other axis, you've got the notion of the level at which you might seek to work, be it society, community, group, or individual. And we can begin to plot where the presences are and where the gaps are in our prevention efforts within a particular community or a society, or indeed even perhaps within a city or a rural area if we're working within a rural context. And at the top right hand side we can see actions such as the provision of new provincial technologies that focus very much on the individual and what might sometimes be called proximal risk. On the left hand side we can see legal reform somewhere between the proximal and the distal and at the far distal end of that spectrum popular movements for social change. These are just some of the possibilities because this is work in progress and you might want to add further initiatives and activities to this diagram in your own work. But the questions we need to start asking ourselves include, are all the parts of this matrix currently in place? Is there, for example, the presence among popular movements for social change in a positive direction? for the forms of solidarity, for the forms of trust that I talked about earlier. Is there, going up one, sorry, is there, I think the batteries are going to fail on me, but never mind. Is there national leadership for social change? The second of the green box is up. In my country, no, there is none. We have no politicians who speak openly about HIV and AIDS anymore. Thank you very much. Are there in <laughs> There's clearly a jinx in the room. <laughs> Second box, green box up on the left hand side. It, are there the forms of national leadership for social change that need to be in place? And have we got, on, moving over to the right hand side, programs to shape the immediate drivers? of specific forms of group behavior. Because of course, most HIV transmission occurs but in at least two individuals, if not more. But I've probably said enough about that because that's just one of a number of frameworks that could be used to begin to think about these ideas more constructively. And I'm also reaching, I know, the end of the time that I have available this morning. So I really wanted to end just by summarizing what I've tried to do. First, I've tried to spell out something of the history of work around social structure in HIV prevention, trying to stress that this is not a new phenomenon. It's been with us for at least 20 or more years. And there are success stories to know about, and there is work to be done. Secondly, I pointed to the developing political economy of HIV, its narrowness in many ways and its unwillingness and inability to produce the forms of collectivism and solidarity and trust that need to be in place. 
I've spelled out some of the key elements of a comprehensive approach to HIV prevention. And I've tried to offer some of the conceptual tools that might be helpful in thinking about this. But in conclusion, I want to stress the value of working together in partnership. Partnership both with each other and <coughs> partnership with the communities most impacted upon and affected by HIV. And I know that there are a number of community people here today and I thank you for being here uh, in, this, in this environment. But the last few years have seen what I'm beginning to characterize as a form of reductivism in HIV prevention. In that what people do and even the course of the epidemic itself is being systematically misunderstood. How else can we explain the UK government patting itself on the back and in every international forum telling people about its success when the epidemiology paints the opposite picture? So this form of reductivism, this misreading is systematic. It's not just a coincidence, it's got a purpose to it. And it holds the very real potential to disorient us, to divide us, to divide the social from the medical, the social and the medical from the community, to fracture even the community itself. If there's one thing we need to remember, it is that sex and sexuality, injecting and other drug-related practices, sex work, transactional sex, the exclusion of indigenous and minority ethnic communities are social processes. And tackling them effectively requires a social response. Understanding these processes and responding to them requires social scientists, community activists, public health specialists to come together because we are all social beings. It requires us once again to recognize that HIV is simply too powerful, too damaging to be left to any one group alone. And it's only through our joint work, inspired by a continuing sense of injustice, that the headway which we've made over the last two, two decades can be maintained. And while I have some anxieties about my own country's capacity and willingness to cope, I know that colleagues here in Canada are up to the task. Good luck to you all. <laughs>